back to Green Planet Blue Planet Podcast. Today I have a special treat for everyone. I'm on the line with two gentlemen who are both in London tonight. Welcome to the show, Olivier and Peter from Le Ciel Foundation. Hi, I'm Olivier. It's nice to meet you. Julian, I know you already, but it's nice to meet uh, everybody who's listening to the podcast right now. And thanks for having us. It's good to be here. Nice. Well, welcome. I'm really, really excited for this conversation. I know you guys are doing some very important work in um, regards to kind of global unity and synchronization of, of like a shared human intention. And I would love to hear in your own words, like, what is Le Ciel Foundation and, and how does it operate? So Le Ciel Foundation is a global mission to um, actually try and help humanity uh, globally raise in consciousness. Um, Le Ciel Foundation has a precise story um, which is the, the story of its nine founders, actually. We, uh, we all have been doing um, our personal and individual work through spirituality for years now. And then at one point, because spirituality works like that, through synchronicities, we finally all met. And that was maybe five years ago. And then um, as we um, progressed in our spiritual research, we started working together and setting up workshops uh, to um, help people uh, in their spirit, in their own spiritual path, and, and maybe uh, help them, um, you know, uh, get rid of issues that they could have in their daily lives. And from that, we develop tools, uh, spiritual tools that we uh, we ourselves call spiritual technology. Um, and, and, um, and, and from that, we actually set up a company that is called Alternate Paradigm all together uh, that could do individual life coaching, but also um, use that spiritual technology and apply it to companies. Um, and then we realized uh, that we needed um, to do something else to actually scale things up because uh, our global aim is uh, to help the entire humanity and doing workshops every weekend with 10 or 15 people uh, takes about 12 lifetimes to actually um, touch the entire planet Earth. Um, so we did something that um, is not that usual in terms of spirituality. Um, when you actually follow different initiations, uh, when you go and meet different wisdom traditions and do rituals with uh, these people, then you are um, able to have uh, visions. And, and through these visions, you uh, may um, have the privilege to know a little bit better what your soul mission is in this lifetime. Um, and usually your soul mission is something that is uh, very private. Uh, all nine of us decided to share those missions and, and to actually collaborate fully so that uh, all of our missions could be achieved in this lifetime. And um, we founded Le Ciel Foundation for that with a global mission of, like I said, uh, raising uh, consciousness and lots of different uh, individual missions uh, that we all put together individual missions that that our co-founders and us have they're all interconnected and all interlocked so it's kind of beautifully designed um, at the moment there's four projects or missions that we started with uh, the first one is the council of the 12 and above uh, where we were tasked with finding 12 specific spiritual elders or spiritual masters from 12 different traditions around the world uh, six women and six men. Uh, that's something that's going to be taking place at the end of November. Uh, the second um, project is, uh, is also related. We, we, Lucy Martins is one of our co-founders and is an award-winning documentary filmmaker. So she's been on all the trips to find the masters over the last 14 months. So the second project is a film uh, called uh, The Twelve. Um, there's a trailer for that already that you can see on our website. The third mission is the, the Wisdom and Nature Art Exhibition and Auction, uh, which opened in London six weeks ago, uh, moved to Paris, and will be concluding as an auction in New York on November 29th. 
Uh, and then there's a fourth mission, which Olivier, maybe you'll share. Yeah, the fourth mission is uh, something that will happen a little bit later as a second part. Uh, it's going to happen maybe in December 2018, and it's called the Wisdom and Nature Symposium. Um, that symposium is actually uh, something, a second part to the, uh, the Council of Twelve. Um, in our mind, he, what the Council of Twelve does, uh, the, that gathering of, of 12 different elders from a, a wisdom tradition, is they set uh, the foundations, they set a framework uh, in terms of morals, in terms of, uh, of ethics, in terms of uh, um, setting the ground to um, the, the, the right, uh, in quotes, the right approach uh, to living our lives as human beings uh, and being uh, interconnected with uh, our environment, with others and, uh, and with uh, um, planet Earth. Mm -hmm. um, because this knowledge we had at one point and as Westerners, we kind of totally lost. Uh, these traditions, they still uh, hold those uh, values uh, very strongly. And, uh, and uh, in their daily life, they actually uh, prove that uh, it's something that uh, preserves balance and, uh, and has uh, tremendous benefits uh, uh, for human beings. So th that council actually lays out the, uh, the, the moral background. And then later, uh, later on in December 2018, the symposium is there to uh, be pragmatic, to find solutions to different issues that uh, uh, Western societies, but the world in general, uh, are conf confronting right now. And, um, and what we realized uh, through our different trips uh, this whole year and through the, 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 the people that we met that there are uh, loads and loads of solutions uh, that already exist uh, at a micro level, right? So the, uh, the, the aim of that symposium is to treat 13 workshops, uh, which represent 13 of the biggest issues uh, that we are facing, uh, can be water, can be agriculture, food, uh, economics, uh, the, the money system, the education, um, and um, try to scale uh, solutions that are, uh, already have been invented um, and uh, finance these solutions, put them uh, into motion and test them after a year and, and uh, take the ones that work and then scale them, offer them uh, open source, uh, scale them up uh, and open them to the uh, entire planet. Um, so the, the goal of that uh, symposium is to have those innovators actually meet the, the right investors and the right influencers, pretty much what you're doing, uh, uh, Julian, um, but in the framework of what the, uh, the, the council um, will put in place in late November this year. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you for like this very conclusive summary of uh, who the CL Foundation is what the, the mission is, and I, I really enjoy how clear you guys are in like these next four steps, um, also over an extended period of time. And, and yes, Olivier, I think that's how we connected um, the first time, is there is a lot of shared mission on the planet already, and I, I feel like sometimes the only piece lacking is really all of us synchronizing over this and understanding we are already kind of going towards a raising human consciousness. Let's just not get distracted with all the, the noise and all the, um, well, <laughs> all the entities that kind of pull attention towards um, a mission that, that's maybe a little less focused. Um, <laughs> so what I really love about your four missions, and let me kind of recap if I understood that correctly, is there's a Council of Twelve happening this November in, um, in New York City, and there's a, a meditation around that that we want to uh, share a little bit more in the run of this conversation. There's a documentary film that I'm really excited about, a story in, in, in a way that it can impact as many people as possible. Uh, you have an art exhibition that's traveling between three of the biggest cities in the world. That alone is, is really amazing. Yeah, that's, that's when, you know, when we started the foundation and, and uh, actually prioritized the different missions that we could see because uh, the, the different missions that we've seen, all nine of them, some of them are maybe going to happen in 25 years. 
So uh, when we prioritized uh, this a year ago and saw those four missions and had no idea uh, how, whatsoever of the way that we could achieve um, uh, one mission uh, and there were four to achieve at the same time, um, the magical thing is that you know when when you're exactly doing what you're supposed to do then things get in place and and they uh, actually uh, have a way to um they have their own life right they, yeah. they, they, they just exist by themselves and then and then they attract uh, everything that they should attract so the exhibition was the the, the really first concrete thing uh, that uh, the, the foundation has set up because it had started in in september and we were the first to be very surprised to have 40 of the biggest artists uh, and photographers uh, that are related, for whom the, the work is related to nature, um, actually be excited by the, the concept of, of the exhibition and, and agree to donate uh, one of their pieces so that uh, uh, we could show them uh, all around the world and have an auction to uh, actually fund the, the rest of the mission. So the, that was a, a big surprise and the uh, the the film is ex exactly the same way i mean we had no idea when we started this that uh, the to the wisdom uh, tradition uh, tribes that we were visiting would be all right with the the, the fact uh, um, that we were coming with a, a camera crew and and wanted to uh, actually hear what they had to share with us um, because the, the film is all about that. It, it's all about giving the, the, the speech to, to these people and, and um, uh, hearing their truth. And then part of the movie is also, of course, follow them from their home uh, uh, countries and, and, and villages to New York City because it's going to be such a shell shock and a, a culture shock that something uh, most brilliant will come out of it on film, that's for sure. Um, so, um, and the council is the same thing. I mean, the, the, we, we've gone through a, a magical process, surprises uh, uh, to surprises, and, and we're, on the, we're ending up in New York. And uh, the idea of a global meditation actually came from people who are not from, from the foundation, but got so excited about the project and, and wanted to participate uh, uh, somehow that they went, let's do something global. Let's all, you know, put our intentions. So this is what is going to happen on the 26th. I mean, any time of the day uh, throughout the entire world, just, you know, uh, it, will it be one minute or 20 minutes of uh, uh, everybody's time? But having a common intention is exactly the, the way to um, uh, actually all understand and accept uh, the fact that yes humanity is moving forward and and the path to a positive outcome is clearly set uh, at one point we just need to realize that it's it's uh, our global and common path that we are the ones walking on it and it we just have to turn right you know and and there you are there you're on the right path um powerful yeah Absolutely. You have something to add, Pete. The, the nice thing about this, the, the four missions and how they correlate is if the, if the meta mission is to support as many people as possible in their own journeys of, of growing in consciousness, uh, the, 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 anyone can relate to beautiful photography of nature. Yeah. Right? It's a very easy opening. Uh, there's nothing dogmatic about standing in front of an extraordinary photograph by David Yarrow or uh, Claudia Andujar, it resonates, right? Uh, we love stories and, and that's where the movie comes in. Absolutely. And the film is not about us. It, it's, it's really a vehicle for the, the elders or the masters to share their relationship with nature and what we can learn from it. The council itself is, is more esoteric and, uh, and, and is more private, although there is an opportunity to support through meditation and connect. Um, and then, you know, the, the symposium itself, the idea of bringing philanthropists and influ influencers and social entrepreneurs together to do business is not a new one. What is new is adding consciously a layer of spiritual technology 
to optimize and support that process, um, that may not have happened. You know, someone very wise said, you know, do we really think that Socrates and Pythagoras, uh, Herodotus, Heraclitus, do we think these people really just use their intellects to come up with these extraordinary theorems? Um, it's just the rational part of the brain, uh, the materialistic aspect. When people ask for scientific data to support the sort of things that we're doing and many other people, uh, it's as if these things can exist in a vacuum without uh, a spiritual aspect. And, and of course, the four people that I just talked about were all spiritual initiates in one tradition or another. And so really it's getting over that separation between the material and the spiritual and trying to marry those to, to dissolve this separation that we have inside of us as individuals or, or between individuals or communities or nation states and recognizing that, that this all has to work in a holistic way. Absolutely. So that what I find really powerful in, in the mission you guys are sharing is that with um, an art exhibition and also a movie, you, it's very much like the communication part of how to get in, in touch with people and also a piece of education, right? But then you're marrying it with location, bringing people together in a physical spot actually really amplifies that in, in, in my experience. So I, um, I find that fascinating and I, I'm really happy that that I can be part of that journey to, to a degree. What I'm a lot more curious about right now is, tell me more about the spiritual technologies. What are, what are we talking about? And um, those wisdom traditions and those elders that you have selected or that, that kind of selected maybe themselves or that were selected um, through this conscious journey, like what are the traditions they come from? So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about the spiritual technology and, and Peter will talk about the traditions. So spiritual technology is a fancy word, but it's, it's a word that actually, um, you know, everybody can relate to because it's all about tools. Uh, as we, um, as humans uh, get um, uh, more and more uh, serious about science and technology, um, they forgot that uh, the principles they apply to science and technology uh, apply exactly uh, the same way to spirituality, meaning um, sp spirituality is not for us, uh, it's not about dogmas, it's not about texts, religions, it's about direct experience. And when you do the, when you have direct experiences of uh, spirituality, um, and w if you use your um, uh, spirituality uh, in certain ways uh, for certain objectives and goals, then, um, uh, and you're curious enough, which is uh, something really important in spirituality, then you develop means to actually uh, get to your objective. You develop tools. Um, so if you take any shaman uh, of any uh, tradition, if he um, needs to resolve an issue for one of his uh, fellow members of the tribe, um, maybe, I don't know, uh, kidney rocks, and he has to uh, make them pass, and he will use uh, spiritual uh, technology to do that, meaning he will have a, a special ritual, he, he will set his intention in a certain way, maybe he would visualize uh, certain um, things that he needs to be, to, that needs to be visualized in his experience to cure that issue, and, and uh, the issue will be solved. So all these things uh, put together are uh, just tools, spiritual tools. And that's what spiritual technology is for us. It's, um, the, is what's, it's filling the gaps that science uh, can't fill for the moment or will never be able to fill because uh, science is about uh, materialism. It's about um, what we call reality, knowing that reality is something very subjective. Um, so, if there's, uh, if, does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, we we can get maybe more specific, even for details. For example, if yeah. we if we uh, in our line of work, what what we can do for people who have uh, a certain a certain issues, say that uh, uh, somebody is terrified of uh, bees, for example. Uh, so what we're going to use is we're going to uh, use a process. We're going to tell that person that 
uh, we're going to uh, have him meditate uh, on something and give him a, a guided meditation. But what we really do is we put uh, through attention and through the tools that we've developed, uh, what we do is we put that person in the state uh, of a conscious dreaming. And in that state of conscious dreaming, the, the things that we're going to, through intention, uh, we're going to have him see in his state of conscious dreaming is all about symbolism. And uh, he, that person will be able to address the issue directly through his subconscious and get rid of the issue uh, uh, without even knowing that he's getting rid of the issue. Meaning, if you're, if you're in your dream state, in your conscious dream state, and you're on the path and there's a huge boulder blocking the... Uh, blocking the path, um, and then intentionally uh, during uh, that state, you're going to take the boulder and try to lift it to take it out of the, the way. You're going to feel that it's very light first, and then it's, there's no problem to uh, shove it out of the way and continue your path. And then in your daily life, you'll uh, uh, realize three days afterwards that your fear of the bee has totally disappeared. Is that, is that a good so, so that's that's like conscious dream work the the question that i that comes up for me so just a little background that that um, neither my listeners know, know you guys know about me I, I used to host a studio space in victoria british columbia um and we we did a lot of work like that actually so we had conscious dreaming workshops and lots of meditation mindfulness workshops um and i did that about for for two years some of them i hosted some of them we, we had facilitators come in um so I'm familiar with that being a reality and something that really, really uh, kind of on a very conscious level or accessing the subconscious can work. How do you, what are the questions that come up for people? Because I understand that for a lot of, for a lot of people, they're very much kind of focused on, well, if it's not tactile and real in front of me, and if science can prove it, it's, it's not real. So where does this line kind of um, dissolve for you guys? So how do you foresee this kind of entering into everybody's sphere? Well, I'll let Peter uh, talk to uh, uh, about that or answer the question. But just very briefly, uh, usually it's because the results are there. So usually you have a friend, a family member, or anybody who did. And, and again, when I'm giving that example, it's just a tiny little example of what can be done. I mean, the, the, uh, the realm of what can be done in terms of spiritual technology are uh, uh, infinite. Um, but usually it's, yeah, direct experience or uh, word of mouth that uh, the results are here. When you see somebody totally change, uh, in, in, uh, in, it can be in a day, it can be in a month, but really pr deeply changed, then you, ten you have a tendency to ask questions. How did you do it? How, how did that happen? And then from the word of mouth, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't... You, that's what usually happens, Pete. Yeah, I can give a, 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 um, a direct example which, which, which happened in real time as opposed to waiting for the effects over the coming hours or weeks or months. Uh, and it, this happened with five individuals, but the first time it happened, uh, someone came to us with an inability to swallow pills, which was inconvenient because sometimes swallowing a pill can be extremely beneficial to you. Um, lady in her 40s um, had been to doctors, psychologists, it's, it's something that could not be resolved. And so it occurred to us what the root cause of that problem was, uh, which was related to a past life experience. And it was because that woman had drowned, right? Which is, not, it was, you tune into it, maybe that's not that surprising, right? There's a problem with the throat, they couldn't swallow. So once we diagnosed that, we uh, did some work, what you might call energetic work, or worked with the woman, the conscious streaming, uh, and very quickly, as in under a minute, we handed her a pill and she was able to swallow it. Now for me, for her, most importantly, that was mind-blowing. For me, it was mind-blowing because even though I'd been a practicing Tibetan Buddhist for 12 years, which meant I believed in reincarnation, for me that moment was impressive because that was a direct experience of, we identified some kind of an echo effect, something that happened in a woman's past life that was affecting her today, the inability to swallow pills. And we were able to transform that. We meaning 
this lady and us. That happened three or four times in, in the following 12 to 18 months. Same problem, inability to swallow pills. And uh, the only difference was there was another person who had the drowning issue. The other three were strangulation or hanging. Same thing. And immediately they're able to swallow a pill. Uh, it's an anecdote. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very real, real example. So let, let me maybe go into the second part of that question um, because, because that's, that's truly interesting. So the, the wisdom traditions that these 12 elders, six women, six men um, come from, is, how, did you, how did you find these people and, and which wisdom traditions are, are we talking about? Well, you, you hinted the, the, the true answer, which is uh, we didn't find them, that they found us. Yes. Uh, you know, how do you go about finding 12 people out of 7 billion in, in 12, 14 months? It, it, it's not easy. There's got to be a shortcut there somewhere. Uh, and the shortcut is, is, is really the, the dreaming or what you might call meditation um, and being able to access certain information. And then how do you triangulate that? So through a series of questions and answers, uh, you get to, or we would get to the person in our network who is closest one, two, three people away uh, from the person we're looking for. And then we pick up the phone or get online um, and say, we're looking for a person in their seventies in Indonesia, has these abilities, looks kind of like this. Um, and we and we'd find ourselves there. Um, well, it from sounds like some advanced magic. If, if I'm if I'm kind of going to be really straight and honest with you, that sounds like out of a movie almost. Well, the the work that that um, Olivier was referring to, um, you know, we we worked with over a period of five years. We we did these workshops and did some individual coaching, and we didn't realize it at the time, um, but with hindsight, that was a form of training for us. We put ourselves in service of other people to help them. And then as in any mystic tradition, uh, you end up working on yourself by helping other people. Um, and at the, it was at the end of that five year period and longer in, in some of our co-founders uh, case, uh, you realize that you develop some interesting abilities. And at that point, we started to find our missions. Uh, which would have been impossible without having done the training. Um, and so having done the training, that put us in a position where we had the ability to, to find the 12, basically to tune into the information. And yeah, that's, really that's the important part uh, to me because there's, no, there's actually no magic uh, happening. Yeah. Uh, and then you can, I mean, even uh, people that are very... Um, um, pragmatic and very scientific can I totally relate to what's happening here. Um, the, the world is, uh, the universe is just information, okay? It's just information that is vibrating at different frequencies. And then, and then the, your brain actually interprets the, uh, the, uh, the, the information in and turns it into a, a, a wood table, a, a door, a, a subway station, uh, concrete uh, trees but it's all information and what meditation does uh, is it just um, enables you to uh, vibrate at a, um, a higher frequency and if you vibrate at a higher frequency then what your brain uh, does it catches uh, information that vibra vibrates higher it's uh, it's plain simple so what, what did, what did the, these elders do uh, to make us find them? They just, uh, uh, they seed, they plant information in, into the universe at a certain level of vibration so that uh, people that actually uh, are able to get the information at one point will catch it and then will decide to act uh, on it or not. This is why, I mean, the while doing our while uh, looking for those 12 masters we actually met people who had actually exactly the same mission we met people who were saying so what are you doing well we're trying to look for 12 masters no way that's what i've been doing for five years 
and, and so there's no there's no real magic. There's just uh, the um, knowledge and and the realization that uh, if you're feeling sad, you're vibrating at such a, at at one level uh, of one frequency level. If you're happy, you're you're vibrating at, at another uh, frequency level. And and if you if you're uh, focused or if you're uh, meditating, then uh, another uh, level of vibration and then absolutely and that, so and, and that that level of vibration you what we call state of mind which is not a state of mind it is a state of vibration then it just uh lets you catch the the information that actually is at the same level than your state of mind that if you're depressed or you're feeling violent or this is the, the kind of ideas that you're going to catch if you if you're into a very violent environment, you will not have other ideas than uh, violent ideas, because that's your uh, the only information that you're able to grasp. It's kind of the information that is around you if you're in an, an environment that's tinted, right? So if I understand you correctly, what you're what you're kind of uh, explaining, and um, it, it's a, in another episode, I, I talked with a, a friend about virtual reality and kind of the way virtual reality. Um, through brainwave induction and entrainment can kind of alter your state of brainwaves and maybe help you entrain certain states. So if you are in an environment that has a certain frequency, let's say, um, the, the, the only way to access, let's say, a nonviolent state or a truly peaceful state or a truly loving state, how, how do you get there? Is that just practice and training and like clarity inside or? That's the, the important path. There's no environment with only one vibration. There is no point where you're in an environment with only violent uh, frequencies around you. All the frequencies, all the information is there all the time. Mm. It's just, it, it all depends on your inner state of being. Okay, so if you're into a, and so it's not, it doesn't depend on your environment. That's why in the middle of, of the most difficult uh, countries that have been in war for uh, 20 years in a row, you find the most unbelievable people that are cellularly made of love. And, and because it doesn't depend on your environment, it just depends on your inner state. And your inner state, the way you progress in your inner state is the, what we're trying to do uh, individually is to uh, raise your consciousness level. And that means being curious, getting interested in what all these different traditions um, have to say about it uh, how the uh, they actually see the how the world is made what the reality is made of and just unplug yourself from the the the, the uh, formal education of the western world which is which goes the the other way it, it the, the the western education is made uh, to numb you out it is it, it isn't made to actually expand your mind and, and expand uh, your vision of what reality is. Um, so this is, to me, the only solution. It's just, it's it, be curious about uh, what people uh, that have been on Earth for more than uh, 10,000 or 15,000 years have to say about what being a human is about. You know, what I, what I would say is, um, of course, it's it's easier to access those states when you're, alone at the top of a mountain surrounded by blue sky and a fantastic view and being in a war-torn area uh, but what Olivier says is, is, is completely correct yeah that's very powerful and um, certainly I've, I've made personal experiences where uh, that, that was very true for me as well and um, just for example I, I lived in a very um, yeah in, in a very how can I say that politically correct in a, in a town in South America where uh, the, the, the mafia was very much in control, the, the drug and, and car smuggling mafia. And um, I was 15, 16 at the time and just never really had any issues whatsoever. And everybody I, I met was like, how did you survive this year in this town? This is where people get killed. And maybe I was oblivious and the oblivion kind of protected me from entering that frequency entirely. But th there was just so much love in that community and so many people that had nothing to do with that world where um, I could just follow my curiosity that I was 15, 16 at the time, um, follow my curiosity that really connected me with a whole different tribe of, of people in that 
in that location. So absolutely, it's, it's possible anywhere in the world. I, I think that's possibly also what we, um, we're all kind of looking for, is how do we get out of this tight-knit matrix that we've kind of co-created at this point, where humans are reduced to a production factor, where humans are kind of taught to be nothing but a, um, a working entity within a system. So what, what it really makes me curious right now, you guys, is those 12 elders, can you tell us a little bit more specifics about them? Like where in the world are they from? What, what spiritual technology do they work with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, there's certain commonalities between the 12. Um, uh, the first one is that, is that they're truly and deeply humble people. Um, they're not necessarily the heads of their communities or their tribe. Uh, they're not necessarily recognized even with a, their own communities as, as being particularly special in any way. Um, they're extremely discreet, um, extremely positive, um, extremely caring. But if you, if you didn't realize who they were, you really wouldn't know who they were. Um, so the way the council is working, what makes them... Um, suitable for this council is that they all hold certain principles. You could call, even call them spiritual keys for humanity. Um, so there's something about these individuals who are not representing their communities or their tribes or their cultures, right? There's something special about these individuals. Um, and they represent something energetically uh, for all of humanity. Uh, which is why they're coming together to do some specific work that only these 12 people can really do. There, I, there are plenty of councils and a, a, obviously an incredible amount of important work that's been done and been put together by many, many different groups of people. Uh, but this is the particular flavor of this council. They come from all over the world, loosely speaking, six, six are from the, the northern hemisphere, six are from the southern hemisphere. Um, we have uh, people from Australia, Japan, Nepal, Thailand, uh, Ethiopia, Gabon, Botswana, uh, Siberia, Alaska, uh, Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. Got it. Um, they uh, many of them have never traveled away from their communities certainly never got on a plane before uh, and you know one of the commonalities amongst them when we when we were able to sit with them um, and explain to them about the council uh, and invite them to take a seat on the council that for the most part uh, they said that they knew that they were coming that we were coming they knew about the council um, one of them even said that their grandfather's grandfather told them about this council. Um, and this ties well with what Olivier was saying before. To me, it seems like the zeitgeist is a frequency that's being broadcast. A bunch of people hear the broadcast in a dream. There's a council of 12. Uh, amazing. Uh, and then if you're curious, you start investigating. It looks like six men. It looks like six women. I wonder what they're doing. Why, why, why are they happening? Has it already happened? Is it going to happen? And then at some point, you know, for Luciel, we realized, well, well someone's going to have to organize this. You know, some, uh, a couple of San Kalahari Bushmen probably don't have the skill sets to uh, book plane tickets and, and raise some money and get a hotel room and make some phone calls. You know, that's our job. You know, we're, we're, we're just messengers and facilitators. Mm. Uh, but they're remarkable people and we were welcomed beautifully and warmly by all of them so yeah the, the um i don't know if because we have to be clear and i think peter was actually but i just want to reiterate um we since since we're mission and we're just we're just pawns and in a in a, in a game that is way bigger than us um, we um, have come to, through our meditations, have an idea, a precise idea of what we think the, the council is about. Um, but it's, it's only what we think. What we, what we know 
uh, or think we know is that these um, 12 individuals with their own uh, separate um, uh, key will just, you know, click like a puzzle. And, and when that puzzle is actually set up, uh, uh, then it will open um, possibilities and, and uh, uh, it will um, open quantums um, for uh, uh, positive outcomes because as we visited uh, these different traditions, they all have something in, in common is that they, uh, they have a, they feel uh, or they see in their visions that humanity has a deadline, uh, that there's a precise deadline in about eight years um, where it will be too late to actually uh, turn around and, and do something else with uh, 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 our lives and this planet. So they all have to the sense that there's an urgency uh, um, in, in the matter and, and that we have to uh, do something about it uh, right now. These, um, these traditions have been saying that for years now, and, and uh, they still, they feel that the, that, that the issue is so important that even though nobody has been listening to them, they're still totally ready uh, to get together and, and, uh, and uh, do something about it and then share what their values can be uh, through a movie so that, um, you know, uh, change can be implemented and, and a paradigm can be shifted. Um, but we as a foundation uh, have no sort of attachment to it because uh, it's, it's, the ideas don't come from us and the, the, the outcome will not come from us, definitely, but from these guys. Right, and if I understand you kind of, um, kind of reading between the lines, it's... it's when these 12 elders meet, there's, there's like a, a key or a puzzle that's syncing up, um, but possibly the ripple of impact are, are many, many more um, smaller puzzles or other puzzles that kind of have to click into each other as well, possibly at the same time synergistically or like a, the way I understand the kind of the bigger cosmic picture is it's a synergistic geometric puzzle. So kind of as we unlock one door, the next domino just starts mm -hmm. That's exactly. and even fractally it's not even dominoes it's just it happens uh, everything happens at the same time that small door that you open and boom 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 all the uh, all the quantic possibilities open at the same time and uh, and the the period of doubt that uh, the human world is facing right now because everybody doubts pretty much everything yeah. Yeah. and everybody who has faith or beliefs is tested every day yeah. in their faith and beliefs and visions, uh, well, that period of doubt is exactly that. It's the, the moment where the, the, the possible, uh, the, the quantums are, are all opening up. And if we go through it with the uh, clear intention of what we want, then the, the achievement will uh, uh, prevail um, at the end. The, 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 the goal will be uh, achieved. And the, the, the 12, you know, and if the, the, the council is called the 12 and, and above. Right, so it's twelve and spirit. Um, but another thing that the twelve have in common is there is no doubt. <laughs> there, there is there is plenty of faith there, and although they're from many different traditions, uh, and this is incredibly important, the game for all of us as individuals on the planet is, is to connect with the sacred within. You don't have to go to a workshop or go to a church. Uh, you are supported by nature. It's easier to do it in a forest or on top of a mountain. But the point is to connect with the sacred within. And then you teach yourself. So regardless of all the missions that we all have or the concerns that we have or, or the, good, the good deeds and the, and, and, and the work that we do as teachers and carers, for, you know, uh, parents, grandchildren, it's to work on ourselves because it's fractal, right? Yeah, so the way that everyone needs to take responsibility for their own development. And as that happens, uh, that triggers other events. Um, I think that's important. Yeah, it's very powerful what, what you guys are saying. That, that is something I fundamentally believe in as well. And, and uh, a collective that I work with over here in British Columbia. Um, and Olivia, you and I talked about that before. Our, our why is also raising human consciousness. And, and we truly, truly 
um, just surrender to, to, I see it as a fact, it's uh, the inside work, right? It's inside work that, um, for me personally, the, the path of plant medicines has certainly accelerated that work. Um, I don't think it's needed necessarily. I think we could just literally sit and close our eyes and, and breathe and tune in um, to, as you said, where do we need to grow as individuals within the collective? Sometimes I have, I'm going to share this vulnerably with you guys, sometimes I have visions like, what if, what, what if humanity would take a five minute break and everyone would just go hug the person next to them for five minutes? You know, this is maybe very esoteric or, or dreaming, but I feel like it's that simple, actually. The moment we would stop to pay more attention to the outside world um, than to the actual inside journey, I think it, it can literally shift within five minutes. That, and, and there's something in here, when we listened to your previous podcast, there was something that was said by one of the people that you interviewed, which is, uh, to me, it's genius. It's about the, the, the glass half full and, uh, and um, half empty. And, and that guy was saying, who cares about the glass? The, the, the only thing that counts is the intention uh, behind the, the outcome that you want to see realized. You don't care about how and what reality exactly is. You just, what you care about is uh, trying to shape reality as you want it to be. And so to fill the glass. <laughs> yeah, and 20 persons having the same intention, it has a ripple effect. Yeah. I'm going to share, share one more small, small story that I just lived over the last months with you guys. And, and um, maybe there's another question that kind of arises from that. So I was just about two months ago, I was in Geneva in Switzerland at a, well, a symposium of some sort. I was at a global meeting at the World Economic Forum for their, their young leadership initiative called the Global Shapers. And we were 350 people, uh, kids, um, under 30. And we were from 150 different countries. It was very, very interesting to see. First of all, the, the under 30 year olds, um, there, there's very little doubt that, that um, we're all the same. <laughs> um, but then what, what came up, and it was really interesting to me because I, I was born in Germany. I lived in South America for a couple of years. I, I live in, in Canada since a couple of years now. So I've seen kind of the, the cultural interactions that, that vary. And then the human kind of resonance at the core is, is always the same because we're all on this human journey. And I was in a, in a North American meetup within, this, within this, um, this Shapers conference I was at. And one of our leaders said, you guys in North America, there's something interesting we observe. You are the ones that least collaborate with each other. If I go to the African group or the Asian group or the South American group, they, they all want to collaborate with each other nonstop. And for me, what I, what I was wondering afterwards, apart from that, of course, it you know, it triggers all kinds of, of thoughts and reactions maybe for a moment. But then I was wondering, well, what is maybe the, the value of this individualistic culture and, uh, that, that we've started very much in, in, in North America? Is there something like the, you know, the polar balance between we are one collective and we are a big group of people. We, we are seven billion uh, like a collective oneness and at the same time we're seven billion for the reason of individually becoming sovereign of our own experience well I think the the, the, the interesting thing is that the, the 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 cultures that actually still collaborate are the ones that are still very much aligned with nature because you know the, the, they have a tradition and they have the knowledge that nothing you can do nothing alone you cannot as a if you're any plant in a forest you 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 will not survive if you're alone uh, and and you will not have a choice anyhow you will be related to the others through mycelium and you will collaborate and you will uh, interconnect and the resources of the entire forest will be managed and will be allocated to different uh, parts of the forest uh, uh, with the different needs. Um, so the culture, the traditions that really have that anchored still uh, at some point because they've, resi they've resisted uh, um, to the what I call Western culture, um, well, they have a tendency to actually uh, uh, emulate what nature uh, 
does, uh, and 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 that is full collaboration. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's actually a fascinating observation, Julian. I mean, you'll notice that in the list of countries I gave you, the the, the countries that are, are being represented in inverted commas by the by the twelve elders, there's none from Europe. Mm. Uh, there is one from Alaska, but not from Nor the rest of North America. Uh, and we don't think that's an accident. Um, and it's also interesting that Le Ciel is pretty much, we're all European. You know, one Polish, one German, uh, two French. Uh, the rest of us are English. I'm, I'm Venezuelan American, but, but grew up in England. Um, th there's something interesting there as well. There's something interesting about the fact that, that the masters are uh, generally not related to religion. Mm. Uh, uh, there's something to look at there as well. Um, in our experience, which I think has been mirrored by, by a lot of other people that we're starting to meet or reconnecting with, is we've not really been collaborating other than within our own little group because what we try to do with Le Ciel is to work or, or to reflect um, the mycelium. Mm -hmm. So there is no hierarchy. So you could look at us or we look at ourselves as nine little saplings uh, working together. Uh, we're deeply interconnected. Uh, no one's in charge. There's no guru. The, the, there's, we, we just support each other in our own individual work. Um, we're really straight with each other. We try not to take other people's loving uh, critiques personally, which of course is very difficult to do. Um, but we've really had homework to do. It's sort of been like doing a PhD for the last five years. So there hasn't really been time, and it hasn't been really the right time to collaborate with, with people outside of our own little ecosystem, our, our, our little pod. What's become clear is, is that we're now starting to meet a lot of really interesting people who've also been immersed in whatever area that's really um, uh, driving them and what they're passionate about. Because of course, the whole thing is in, interconnected. The 12 workshops we're gonna be representing at the symposium are all interconnected. You can't work on one thing and have it siloed from something else. You know, economics is related to agriculture, is related to education, etc. It's like so the mycelium now, itself, right? Yeah, so, so now is the time where we're really starting to open up and say, hey, you know, what, what, what have you guys been working on? Oh, you know, maybe we can help you with that one. Maybe you can help us. Uh, the, the network is really starting to hum now. Um, and one of the things that's really exciting for us about our company, um, Alternate Paradigms, is we're now gonna have the ability and the opportunity to go into companies and organizations, foundations, charities, and say, you know, maybe we can help you guys uh, realize your own goals. We don't lecture anyone in the same way that it, you wouldn't lecture someone on, on how to grow in consciousness. You can just support and create the space for that to happen. But we're looking forward to more and more collaborations like that in the coming year. But do you know that there's something uh to me, it still is a natural process. Uh, meaning, you know, at first you have a seed and then uh, from the seed, there's a tree that grows and then, and then there's two trees, three trees and then other plants and then it makes a tiny little forest. And then, but that forest is not uh, uh, interconnected with the forest that is two miles from there. What is gonna happen is that other trees are gonna uh, grow in between and then, and then everything's going to intertwine. But you, there's, it all starts with little ecosystems that actually grow themselves, get autosufficient, and then they can collaborate and everything can get intertwined. And that's exactly what's happening for the past 10 years with um, all these people that actually uh, uh, do work that has a meaning in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, outcome for humanity it's that they all these little ecosystem grew out to be self-sufficient and now everybody can extend hands and actually work together um because that's what nature does powerful well you guys as we're kind of concluding this this interview and coming coming to the, the end of this this hour-long conversation i'd love to 
ask you my favorite question on this podcast, actually. And it, it relates with everything you guys have been sharing so far. And just as a little piece of information, this question is truly why I started this podcast. And nice. my, my intention um, is, is really to get people to kind of look way beyond where, where we are right now in terms of timeline, but also in terms of possibility. Because often when we lift off the pressure of time and money, people's minds go to very, very different places. So uh, here's the question. If we as shared humanity had a 200 year or 500 year plan, like a vision for humanity, how would something like that look like in your guys' eyes? So you would, you, you're asking us to see forward in 200 years it is, or 500 years, is that it? That, that's it. I mean, wherever you want to take this question, either how, what do you see, are we going to be in 200 or 500 years? Or maybe how, how would we actually get to the place of establishing such visions? Because I think um, that's also a part of the question, right? Like, how do, what does it take to actually flip our mindset from four-year um, political cycles and, and instantaneous economic to-dos into, well, let's, let's think of the longevity of our planet and our species? Either way you want to take this question. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we won't have exactly the same answer with, uh, with Peter. Um, to me, and because I'm talking about di direct experience, um, there is no, it's something that is so human to, you know, try to actually picture what humanity will be uh, in 200 years. Um, and, and if, to me, if we continue to actually uh, uh, have these questions in mind, it just takes, uh, uh, it just takes us out of sync. It takes us out of the flow because the flow is leaving uh, every moment at its fullest. And, and as we think about these questions, where are we going to be in 200 years? then we stay in the state of mind that we are and we'll surely be instinct in 200 years. Um, so to me, it's all about slowing things down and, and taking, and you know, the problem with human beings is that they, they actually have, they're so self-conscious that um, they think that they need to see big, but uh, they don't need to see big. And you, you don't see, I, I'm pretty sure that um, uh, any other mammal on the planet doesn't, actually plan what uh, the, the future of uh, Wales is going to be in 200 years. Um, they just live every moment to the fullest. And, and by doing that, they're actually in sync with the entire universe. And, and by being in sync with the entire universe, they actually live forever. Uh, so that's my, that's my point of view. You, 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 Absolutely, I, I get it. You're, you're, flip, you're flipping the answer, saying, "Don't, don't look outwards. Yeah, Far away. See, look into the yeah, very now." Yeah, we need to see things smaller and and actually understand that we're just one cog, uh, uh, one little uh, piece of machinery in something that is so big that we cannot even understand or apprehend what it is, and that we should come back to a little humility and and just live, you know, simply. That's what I think. Thank you for that answer. Peter? Yeah, I mean, I, I know what Olivier thinks I'm going to say, but it, it, it's, not, it, it's not that different. I mean, through our journey, uh, particularly with the council, so say the last 18 months, um, we had no idea what the outcome was, and, and we still don't know what the outcome is going to be. Right? So we worked on a, on, on a need-to-know basis. Um, and then you combine that with faith and then you, you just try to take the next step perfectly. If you try to go too far down the line and try to anticipate what the goal is and try to derive a specific strategy to get from A to B, you're going to miss all this magic and all the quantum stuff that's around you. Um, and I would say the same thing as Olivier. Uh, he used the word humility, but I'd, I'd flip it and go, it's arrogant to think that, you know, that we can really control all that much. There's a much, there seems to be a much bigger design. 
Um, and, and a little bit of humility goes an awful long way um, when you just take one step at a time. Um, we seem to have been running some kind of algorithm over the last two, five hundred years, you know, pick a number, um, where humanity has been exploiting nature. Now, when there's just a few hundred people are running, running around the planet, that doesn't really matter too much. But when you get to seven billion, we've got a bit of a problem. Um, we need to bring humanity's relationship to nature uh, back into balance. And so how is that going to be done? Otherwise, and, and Olivia uh, alluded to this earlier with what the, the, the masters have to say, we've only got about eight years, forget about 200 or 500. There are certain milestones and, and all these 12 different traditions from all over the world say this. There are certain milestones that need to be met by 2025. Um, the parlor games of, you know, where are we gonna be in 20, 50 years? That, 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 that may not be a game that, we, that we're, um, uh, we, we're gonna have the, the, you know, the, the free time to play with pretty soon. Um, the stakes are pretty high. And it, and it all starts with, with the individual. Um, and, and, you know, in the West, we, we're at a disadvantage because of our education and, and the conditioning that we've all had. Um, we think that we know so much, but we know nothing. You know, we, we've had people in the West come to the, the Wisdom and Nature exhibitions and look at some of Lucy's film and go, yeah, yeah, I get it. You know, we're supposed to give these guys some money and, and you know, assuage our guilt that we're knocking down their trees. And, it, and it's... <laughs> You know, we start laughing. It's like, no, yeah, it's not that at all. It's the guys from these wisdom traditions um, who do know how to live together in, in community uh, with each other and in harmony with the forest. They're coming to help us save our own asses. They have the information. We don't have the technology. I mean, we, we have a, it's some pretty interesting technology, but, it, but we're so off balance. We need to find some balance. And then there's an amazing future out there for us at some point. So we can intend for the best possible future for ourselves and our families. But, but let's not be prescriptive. Let's be open to the wonder of what, what might happen. We, we might be surprised. I get it. Wonderful. So basically, both of you are calling us into more presence. And I, I heard you stretch these eight years again, that it's very important that we we kind of find the balance between the heart and the mind and the traditions that are maybe so much more in the know-how to be and live in collaboration at this well, point. Yeah, and, and because this is very, things are very simple. And when, when you actually listen to what life has to tell you and, and then life provides, that's that's pretty much it. You don't need to worry about anything if you just listen to what life is telling you. And if you actually live your life going through whatever happens to you, taking it as a lesson to improve yourself, then life uh, meets you with an open hand and will provide. Um, so we don't have a lot to worry if we actually... Uh, relearn what our ancestors knew i mean we just we've been going crazy for about 150 years that's it uh, so it's a very short uh, period of time we can totally um, um you know uh, just step back and and take a, a, another path it's not that difficult well thank you both so much for taking the time peter and, and olivier and um kind of sharing your, your insights, your perspectives, and kind of calling listeners and, and myself into the responsibility of, of, of becoming present to not necessarily the magic, but the true depth that's inside of all of us. So thank you for being on the show. Thank well, you yeah. for having us. And, and again, please, uh, everybody join us on the 26th of November. And, you know, set your own intentions of uh, how you'd like the world to be. And, uh, and uh, let's all, you know, uh, put that together and make it happen. That sounds like the next perfect step.
Wonderful. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Thank you.